How's it going, everybody? Welcome back to the Blue Shifting, and welcome back to the Fruitiger style, where last episode was really spicy, really cool. So we were able to track down the missing Sachi, who turned out to be waiting in the park where she had played with her childhood friend, Yuji, which was a really cool twist. I kind of saw it coming a little bit, but like not so far ahead that it wasn't still really a pleasant surprise. Uh, some of you pointed out some really interesting little Easter eggs that kind of just show the cohesiveness and the the writing that was going into this uh, from the beginning, which is really cool, which is how when they're talking about giving nicknames to Yuji, uh, Sachi actually recommends Yukun, which is, you know, the childhood nickname. And then there was also a point, I guess, in a conversation where uh, like the like the term or 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 uh, like like Yuji mentions a playground and you can and Sachi apparently like kind of contemplates it a bit maybe that being the point where she kind of connects the dots and realizes that this might be the exact same kid whom she was friends with when she was younger who she had really fond memories of which we're going to get a bit of a glimpse of it looks like here but yeah so ultimately just a really fun little narrative I don't know I wouldn't call it Easter eggs really just more of a continuity that's really cool to see and. Uh, just shows the level of dedication in writing. I, I, it's sad that we can watch like, like multi-million dollar movies that fail utterly to maintain continuity and have no real idea of how to establish a canon. I, I like it's sad because I've actually just been watching like a breakdown of just how terrible like, uh, Rise of Skywalker and like the 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 sequel trilogy of Star Wars is ultimately, and a big part of it is got to be that cohesiveness. Um, establishing and you're representing like plots and developments and like ultimately especially in the last movie just making stuff up as they went like it sucks when you really try and break it down like when you really look and analyze that movie it's like a lot of movies like Star Wars you have to kind of squint out a little bit and be like yeah, okay I'm gonna take some of this with a grain of salt and I can still really enjoy it but even those ones it's like you just can't there's just so much illogical nonsense going on so it's like whatever so Always very happy to see how a visual novel is treated with such care and love and that they tend to be very cohesive and very consistent throughout the whole thing, especially when you realize a lot of these are made with multiple writers. So again, it's not just that they're written by different people. They, the, the writers tend to also coordinate, try and find like commonality and keep like certain aspects through. Like Obviously, they're talking to each other and working with each other. It's fantastic. Man, it makes me really want to get work on a visual novel. They're doing like like there's like uh, upcoming game jams and there's one that's even for like a visual novel group and I don't think I'll join an official game jam but I'm thinking of doing either like a, a parallel game jam or a NaNoWriMo this year and trying to really focus on doing a little bit of writing every day and really putting some work into a script because uh, I've got some outlines going and I really want to just try even if it's garbage and even if it's not that great like you got to start somewhere and maybe it's just time for me to really just put that energy into it and just see what I can do. Who knows? Maybe even like a like a halfway decent visual novel will still be really fun to share with you. So ideally, that's something I'll try and do at some point. But anyway, enough about that. Let's jump right in, shall we? Let's see what this mystery reveals and where does Yuji go from here when it comes to this? Because like, he's obviously been fascinated by Sachi. He even talks about how like he feels a kinship with her. But now he's got this. I wonder what he's going to do with it because he's like, He's going to suddenly have a childhood friend, and I don't think he ever assumed he had one. Like, he had this vague memory, but now he's like, oh, this was a real person, and they're back in my life now. What do I do with this? All right, so let's go. So wait, you could. I think this is because, like, his, like, something happened with his family, and he had to leave. Even after hearing Sachi's story, this is about as much as I can remember. As children, we parted abruptly. Our bur burgeoning friendship was cut off without warning. That must have happened when I was forced to move away after my sister's death. That much makes sense. Okay, so sister dead. That's another little nugget of information to put away. I get the feeling that I'm uh, that I'm going to eventually, as I play the other routes, I'm going to be able to really unravel like his hat pit history. I'm guessing that details about his life are going to be scattered through the rest of the stories. 
So yeah, that'll be really interesting to see, and I'm curious to, to kind of suss it out. I am going to be, because we're going to be getting towards the end of this series, I've had to focus a lot on rewrite, but I now, am, now that's done, I need to start putting energy into this because I need to prepare for the for this finale because like we're getting close to the end of this series, but I need to have played the other routes by the time we talk about it. So while we still have probably several weeks worth of content for this, I need to start like putting some work in to get through the other routes. So I may start getting more information in the coming weeks about his history and about his life that I may start referencing. Um, but if I do, I'll let you know that like I'm gleaning this from other routes. All right, anyway, must have happened when I forced him to move away. Yeah. But there's still one part of all this that I find completely inexplicable. I understand that Sachi had to be the same person who played with me as a child. But the girl in my memory was energetic and strong-willed in the extreme, a little spoiled even. Her personality and way of speaking were totally unlike the Sachi I know today. Again, a great example of why, like, it makes total sense that he didn't recognize her. I wonder if she recognizes that. That she's changed a lot. Because she might... Her, her self-reflective perspective might not recognize it. Of course, people naturally change as they grow up, but I don't know of many transformations that dramatic. Something must have triggered such a radical shift. I'd guess that something is connected to our conversation back then, but there's no way to know for sure until I learn more about Sachi's past. What with how, what, what with, with what happened over the last two days, I think that's become necessary. <laughs> Ah, Chizuru. Sorry, felt like getting some air. So? Dropping the line of questioning, Chizuru walks up to the stand at my side. Good. Appreciate it. Sorry to push all the work on you. あなたが見つけてくれたんだから。She's got four dedicated nurses at the moment. I think she'll be all right. それはそうだけど。でも、Women don't like having men ogle them as they sleep, right? Oh, I don't know if that's a joke. I think he's probably quoting somebody. Blame my sister. I inherited it from her, but anyway, I... Right. Remember what you told me a little while ago? How you don't expect me to do anything particular in this school for its students? I've got a follow-up question. Are you are you willing to let me get involved on a voluntary basis? Eh. Mochiro. Good good to know. Sounds almost like she was expecting this from the very start. Guess there's a reason she'll she's able to get by sitting around and sipping expensive tea all day. What's an Ichigaya mission? I wonder what that's referencing. No, but I didn't come to this school for duty or profit. You might say I'm here precisely because I wanted something more than that. Right. I wanted to understand the meaning of the words my master left me. Also, in a way, I owe Sashi my life. Sachi and I knew each other as kids, and it's probably thanks to her that I managed to push my way through the worst of it. We barely know anything about this. Not surprising, I just remembered a little while ago myself. So. Lowering her hand from the fence, Chizuru turns to face me. Circumstances aside, simple truth is Sachi caught my interest as she is today. Like I said before, that won't be necessary. That's a bit fair. Like, it's funny because, like, the idea originally was, like, I don't want to breach, like, their confidants or, like, you know, like, I don't want to glean information without them knowing I understand it. 
But it's not that different with her because she'll just answer all the questions he asks her. But even still, and even if it's just the principle of the thing, it'd be better to hear it from her. That's not it either. I'll handle this my way. In this case, maybe it's a pointless roundabout method, but I've gotten by with it all this, all this time. So I'm going to stick with what I know. Was that supposed to be a compliment? <laughs> I wonder. Blatantly evading the question, Shizuru offers me a composed smile. Alright. Think that's about time I get going. I'm counting on it, Principal Tachibana. Well then. Stepping outside the school grounds, I retrieve my cell phone from my pocket. Even if it does ultimately come down to asking for someone's help, I'll stick to the methods I trust most. If I want to change something, to accomplish something meaningful, I think that's the way it has to be. Julia, I need a favor. Mm, so sweet. Yeah, no, don't jinx it, Makina. あんたはさらっとなんてこと言うのよ。うん、それだけサッチンが心配なのよさ。心配しなくても平気よ。看護師さんから話を聞いた限りでは疲れて眠っているだけらしいから。それならよかったのよさ。でもユージ、よくサッ
And a split second later, the person I've been expecting emerges from the driver's seat. And I appreciate it. Yeah, I do. And I appreciate it. Okay, I that's a little weird. That's a little weird. I, I knew what he was going to say. <laughs> when I offer a few straightforward words of thanks, JB furrows her brow. She's like, oh, he must be serious. He's not doing some stupid joke or being sexist. Something wrong? My bad. As JB speaks, she holds out a single manila fold envelope. Interesting. The fact that it has to be confidential is interesting. I wonder what it could possibly say in there. Again, there's that, that idea that like she's received, potentially received training of some kind. Right. That's why I had to ask you, Julia. Thanks. I owe you big for this one. JB shrugs her shoulders as I take the documents from her hand. It's not that I don't trust Chizuru, but I prefer to get my information from a familiar, reliable source. Yeah, not a problem. Mm -hmm. That doesn't sound good. I see. I was more or less expecting JB to read the document before handing them over, but judging from her vague language, it seems there was indeed something fairly dramatic inside. Don't know yet, but... If there's something I can do for her after reading these, I think I will. Yeah. JB answers my words with a searching gaze, her expression unusually serious. I stare steadily back into her eyes, and for a moment there's silence between us. So, you're not opposed to the idea? Alright. In other words, you trust me. So, True enough. With my master and my older sister dead, JV is without a doubt the foremost living authority of the subject of me. Okay, what do you mean by that? Yeah, of course, that was the plan. Huh. So she's worried that he might get the desire to just quit or move on with his life? That's weird. Apparently satisfied, JB gives me a friendly thump on the shoulder as she passes by. Right, I appreciate the help, JB. Yeah, with what money? Returning to her usual playful tone, JB deftly brushes a loose strand of thick golden hair into place and steps back into her car. Yeah, I'll make a note. As the prancing horse grows small in the distance, I mutter wryly to my smell. Myself. My smell. Good grief. After returning to the courtyard, I sit down on a nearby bench and examine the contents of the envelope JB hands me. Hmm. At a glance, it's six pages filled with text, almost certainly printed from a personal computer. So now I've got my hands on Sachi's past. What's more, I managed to obtain it quietly from a source with absolutely no connection to these events. For JB, it was probably a simple job involving nothing more challenging than a few minutes of database crawling on a neglected terminal. But this way... If, I, if and how I make use of this information is completely up to me. Okay. Hey, Sachi. Hmm. 
When I open my eyes, I'm staring up at an unfamiliar ceiling. Coco. The lights are off, and there's only a faint illumination falling in from the window. But as my eyes grow accustomed to the darkness, it doesn't take long for me to realize that I'm in the hospital. So, I was Kazumi-san must have carried me here afterward. And judging from the uh, tuna fish man figurine standing watch at my bedside, Maki-chan and the others paid me a visit. Kazumi-san Kazumi and I played together as children. For a time, he was a very dear friend of to me. I realized this some time ago, but I didn't believe that knowledge prompted any dramatic change inside me. Therefore, I had assumed the same was true for kazumi that he'd realized the truth long ago and simply decided to keep things as they were. But in reality, he'd never associated me with the girl he knew back then. To him, the usual place was somewhere else entirely. The thought makes my heart ache. Aww. <laughs> for some reason, when I close my eyes, I see kazumi sorrowful face looking down at me on the playground. And as I remember that moment, the vi vice gripping my chest grows gradually tighter. I'm not liking where this train of thought's going. Remember that theory I was postulating? That for whatever reason she doesn't trust herself anymore? That that trust has been so eroded by either things that have happened to her or... Or like, like, like decisions that she's made that fell apart. That she's decided to just relegate all decision making to other people and be a good girl. I think I was right. And more so, if it was a self-defense mechanism that suddenly isn't working anymore, that could become disastrous. Because it's suddenly the one thing that helps keep her sanity, keeps her grounded, the thing that keeps her from like going over the edge, is crumbling away. That safety net is gone. What is she going to do? She has to confront whatever those feelings were that drove her here. The more I think, the more sluggish I feel, and as I thought, as though a heavy weight is pressing down on my body. Thank goodness I'm alone. If someone else had been here, I'm not sure I could have been my normal self for them. After all, I'm currently incapable of something as simple as reaching over to turn, off the, turn on the lights. <laughs> Soon enough, my physical discomfort is accompanied by a building sense of panic, inexplicable in words. A horrible choking sensation crawls slowly but steadily up my throat. <laughs> As I moan incoherently, my hands reflexively clutch at the blanket draped over my body. I squeeze my eyes tightly closed in an attempt to shut out the reality. <laughs> it's no good. The harder I try to repress the memory, the more clearly it rises to the surface. I know that it's the cause of my pain, but I simply can't escape that image. Perhaps it's because I'm weaker than usual after my long wait in the rain. Even as I wince at the first throbbing steps of, of a sudden headache, an overwhelming weariness washes over my body. Just keeping my eyes open seems unbear unbearably burdensome. <laughs> my field of vision grows narrower as my eyelids fall halfway closed. So I faintly hear the sound of my clenching teeth rattling in my mouth. It feels as if the temperature of the room has plunged to the point that I almost expect my breath to form white clouds before my eyes. I roughly gasp for air, panting like a dog, helplessly enduring the unceasing waves of pain. <laughs> Just a panic attack, really. Eventually, it becomes difficult to tell whether my eyes are open or shut, and as my physical agony reaches its climax, it's joined by an unfathomably profound sense of loss. My trembling hands creep upward, seeking reassurance that my head hasn't simply been lopped off at the neck. <laughs> it's alright, that couldn't possibly have happened. I understand the rationale rationally, but the delusion is so vivid I can't bring myself to lower my hands. I think I've mentioned this a one time, but like I've had one instance where my reality seemed to collapse around me, and it was interesting. It's like um, so I had a, a, a I had gallstones. I had to have my gallbladder removed in college, and when it struck, like was I get this horrific stabbing pain in my like in my gut. And I remember at its peak, which what led me to go to the hospital was I got a stabbing pain so severe and I got a fever so intense that I was just kind of writhing in bed like for hours and hours. And it got so bad. The pain was so severe and the, and the fever got so, so intense 
I started having hallucinations. I started having, like, I was seeing things in my room. And I, like, that my only grounding was the fact that it couldn't possibly be true. And it's going to sound stupid. And it really is stupid. Um, but if any of you have watched, like, the US version of The Office, I was in my room, just my own room, like, in a basement. I had carpet and, like, just, like, a big bed and just my all my stuff. And I remember I was laying in bed, and I looked, at, I looked over towards the door. And while I could see my room in the dark, at the same time, it looked like my room was lit up like midday. And several of the characters from the U.S. Like, uh, version of The Office were in my room, and they were putting tile flooring down on my floor. And they were arguing about how to do it, and they were doing it wrong. And they were having these really stupid conversations about like what they were supposed to be doing and why they were supposed to be doing it and why what they were doing wasn't working and what they were doing was actively like completely wrong. It was messing up my carpet and my room and just, just everything was being destroyed in my room. But I could stare at it and like it looked like it was really there. But I also could see my own room that was clearly not having these fictional characters in my room. And so that was the only thing that kept me really sane was knowing that that couldn't possibly be actually happening even though I could hear it, I could see it, and I felt like I could touch it if I reached out. When you get to the point where like you're having like a bit of a break, whether you're sick or whether you're having like a like a like a manic or panic episode, these things can feel very real and tangible. And I bet you like if you don't have something that's grounding you like this is clearly so absurd it can't possibly be real. This can be life-altering and terrifying. Post-traumatic stress disorder. PTSD. As a child, when I first suffered these symptoms, the doctor who examined me dispassionately offered that diagnosis. A severe mental illness brought by violent wounds to the mind, leading to a persistent rage, range of self-stress-related self imp impediments. I've researched the disorder and its symptoms in great detail over the years from every source I could find. Among the many symptoms, the one I truly fear is clinically referred to as recurring and involuntary memory, more commonly known as flashback. <laughs> if I curl my body into a tight ball like this, I can endure the pain and exhaustion somehow. But the worst of the suffering is yet to come. <laughs> as I beg to imagine that moment, I begin to imagine that moment, tears flood out of my eyes and I shake my head from side to side like the spoiled child throwing a temper tantrum. <laughs> Lukewarm drool dribbles out of my gaping mouth as I rack my dry, racked by dry heaves. Oh, that's the worst. Wanting to throw up and trying to throw up, but your body has nothing to throw up is the worst. At some point, my, gro uh, my, uh, my groans give way to convulsive sobs. <laughs> oh my gosh. This is how it always happens. After enduring the pain, I see the dream. The memories I've tried so very hard to forget force their way into my mind still vivid and clear after all this time. The profound darkness buried deep inside my own consciousness effort, conscious efforts pushes its way back to the surface. How many times have I seen this dream since that day? The mere idea of trying to count seems rather ridiculous by now. I'm never, I'll never escape this nightmare, will I? Never. It'll be with me for all eternity. And the nightmare begins as always with two words. Oh no. Oh no. X, 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 X. Oh, that's her parents. The workshop was consistently filled with the clamor of industrial machines, but when I shout out a greeting, my parents never failed to put down their work and answer. My gentle mother, who always smelled like freshly dried laundry, and my smiling father, whose face consistently smeared with grease and oil. I love them both very much. My earliest memories from these days be I, uh, before I entered elementary school are all wonderful, ha wonderfully happy. My dad was a metal worker, an engineer from Niigata, and my mom was born into a family that operated a small precision manufacturing workshop in Kanagawa. About 20 years ago, they met at a technology fair and fell in love. Soon enough, they'd started up a little factory of their own on the outskirts of the small city. That's actually kind of cool. Like a little homegrown, little like specialist shop where they could make custom jobs for various needs. 
I was born shortly thereafter, completing the intimate little family of three. That's just kids, man. And maybe colic. I know uh, my sister had colic and she would just ball and ball and ball. でも夕方までに納品の仕事がまだそんなのは後で頭を下げれば何とかなるそれよりサチの命の方が大事だサチ's order place that freshly established workshop tended to be small in scale and its track record couldn't have been called excellent even as polite flattery the primary cause? My parents prioritized their newborn child above all else, frequently missing important deadlines for my sake. Well, I mean, that's that's fair, I think. But despite their inconsistent job performance, their character won respect and affection. Our young family was able to get by thanks to the support of others. A certain place. そろそろお夕飯の準備もしないといけないんだけどああ仕事の方は心配しないでいいから二人で行ってくるといいすみませんいいさどうせもうすぐ片付くしねじゃあお父さんの好きなおビールも買ってくるありがとう Sachi it's very cute. I like how like like her mom's got like a little like a hair flick, like a like a little like stray hair that just sticks up. Every once, uh, even once I get a little bigger, I spend lots of time with my parents, especially in the evenings. I'd always pull my mom's hand and beg her to go shopping with me. Okay, so it's interesting. So she says Hamburg. She says Salisbury steak. Is that just because, like, when she says Hamburg, it's not a ground meat patty, but it's actually, like, a cut of, of like, beef? Huh. No. そうね。サチはサメが好きなのは知ってるけど、できれば別のものにしてほしいかな。それならサチ、タコさんウィンナーがいい。What an interesting girl. ごめんね、サチ。どうしてお母さんが謝るの? Yeah. I feel like if you have to restrict because kids can be kind of crazy, the best thing you can do is narrow down a list for them, which is what she kind of tries to do in post. But yeah, I mean, kids can be kids. Sachi, お母さんが作ってくれる目玉焼きとタコさんが一番大好きだよ。ありがとう。私もサチのことが大好きよ。あらサッちゃん、今日もお母さんと一緒でいいわね。Aww. Thinking back on it now, our household was definitely on the poor side. You could count on one hand the number of times per year the real treat of a, metal, of a meal graced our dinner, plate, dinner table. But mom's cooking was always delicious anyway, and more importantly, I loved the feeling of her soft, warm hand wrapped around mine. Fortunately, the adults around us watched over our family with warm gazes and small acts of kindness. いつもすみません。いやいや。うちも駅向こうにできたスーパーのせいで大変なんだが。ごみねさんには変わらず引きにしてもらってるからね。ああ、that's oh, really sweet. This is a bit better, a better picture of them because they're both smiling here. Very sweet. Ah, 
Surrounded by mom's cooking, we thanked each other for our daily labors and dad tilted his beer glass. When the dishes in front of us were about halfway gone and the glass sat empty in front of him, dad would always sit back in his chair and start to tell me a story. Nah, Sachi. Sachi wa etching ute shittiru kai? Uh-huh. Kita koto nai. Anata. Sachi wa mada gosai desu yo. Ima kara sonna koto shittiru hou ga okashii wa. So ka na. Ore ga Sachi kurai no koro ni wa. Oh, be careful with that. Like, some of those things should not be handled with. ってさっち工場の機械を触ってるよりも、お人形さんと遊んでる方が楽しいもん。うーん。やっぱりそうか。さっちは女の子だもんな。うん。さっちは大きくなったらお母さんみたいなお母さんになるの。That's so cute. おお。サチは嬉しいこと言ってくれるな。じゃあ、おもちゃのお人形さんを作っていた。お父さんの親戚の家の話をしてあげよう。うん。お人形さんの話だったらサチ聞きたい。That's so cute. That stories were almost always connected to his job somehow. Even so, it was fun to hear about new things and I was in awe of him for knowing all that super complicated stuff. But what always impressed me more than anything else was his amazing heartiness. He really sounds like an engineer at heart, soul. Like the true engineer, like the one who gets their hands dirty. <laughs> Dad loved playing with machines from a very young age, so he could repair almost anything. Because of that, the things we brought te bought tended to last much longer than they would normally, and I always thought of him as some kind of wizard. Ah, <sighs> これはオルゴールって言うんだ。オルゴール。この箱を開けるとね、音が鳴るような仕掛けになっているの。へえ、そうなんだ。サチはオルゴールを見るの初めてだったかしら？うん。それにね、なんだかすごく素敵な音がした
There's also probably some really, really weird ones, but mostly it sounds like they go for creative. So, that's why I'm going to be a little bit of a little bit of a little bit of a little bit of a little <laughs> I love that. He's like, we gotta capture this. <laughs> uh oh, troubling waters. Ah, Sachi yeah, I get that milk. From that day forth, the sound of that music box became a familiar part of my life. The gentle melody that accompanied our family gatherings felt almost like a, a symbol of happiness itself. I'd always understood that Dad loved me just as much as Mom, although he was often busy with work. And since I happened to love him very much myself, I had a habit of being begging him to play with me on the weekends. お父さん、お外に遊びに行こう。おお、サチはいつも元気だな。日曜日はね、お外でお父さんと遊ぶ日って決めてるの。It's a そしたらここに目がけてそのボールを投げるんだ。ボールを投げる。え。おお、うまいじゃないか、サチ。初めてでここまでできるなんてすごいぞ。本当。ああ、お父さんは運動ダメだったけど、そういうところはお母さんに似
It makes mommy and daddy happy when I clean up. If I do it again, they'll play with me more. Motivated by that simple thought, I began to clean the workshop in our house whenever I had time. They cared about her so much, though. And sure enough, whenever I cleaned up for them, my, my, my parents would emerge from the workshop with designed smiles on their faces. After witnessing that same, same scene play out countless times, I'm sure the neighbors had me down as a slightly spoiled little tomboy. Not that I noticed at the time, so caught up in every precious moment. Back then, my world consisted of nothing but two things, before the things before my eyes. The pla places my short legs could carry me, and, and it was more than enough. I mean, it makes sense. I, I, remember, I remember that feeling of just, like, just simple life. Just, like, you wake up in the morning, and you just tackle the day, and you don't think about anything. But eventually, my way of thinking did undergo a clear change. That day, a little while into my first year of elementary school, I proudly brought home my first perfect test. See, look at that. Like, that that's so Sachi's face right there. That's amazing. Yeah, they're like, holy crap, we have like a genius. あ、すまない。あまりの驚きで思わず呼吸が止まってしまっていたよ。いくらなんでもそれは驚きすぎですよ。そうだよ、お父さん。いやいや、決してそんなことはないぞ。お父さんも何度か100点は取ったことがあるが、算数のテストで取ったことはなかった。うん。サチは運動神経がいいだけじゃなくて、頭もいいんだな。そうね。今日
and the people I loved had smiles on their faces. That was more than enough for me. But those tranquil days didn't last forever. Oh boy. Oh boy. Alright, we're gonna be a long episode today. One day, word got out that Dad's family had received a contract for grinding lenses that would be used on the space shuttle, leading to media interest in a TV interview. We'd contributed intricate metal pulp molds that were now valuable manufacturing assets. With a sudden burst of publicity, a few major orders started trickling down to our workshop as well. Dad had always been skilled, and now he had a chance to prove it. In the blink of an eye, rumors were spreading about the high-quality precision dyes our workshop produced. Dyes? I'm, die, I, I'm guessing that is something I'm just not familiar with. Before we knew it, our little branch of the business was flooded with more orders than even his parents' workshop. A year or so after these events, my life had changed dramatically. Back from school, I yelled out a greeting to the workshop from farce of habit, but there was no answer from mom and dad. Instead, I was welcomed home by the drone of industrial machines, a constant companion from, uh, from morning through night. It was so loud. On the dining table, a gorgeous meal was waiting for me, but the clouds of steam that proved that food was freshly made were missing. Oh. The pencils I used to wear down to the nub had all been replaced with nice new pens, and I no longer heard Dad's encouraging voice at my side as I studied. They got too busy. Rich, but busy. I could wear all sorts of brand new clothes, but Mom didn't so sh uh, shark apl uh, uh, shark appliques onto my dresses anymore. Yeah, that's funny. It's so interesting because remember that's that's the shark has been a kind of a theme. Like the pouch that she made for Michiru was a shark, and it was like a childhood thing. It wasn't just like a random choice. Wow. Among all these, what hurt the most was the simplest change of all. I no longer spend much time with my parents. Producing metal dyes as a precision manufacturing requires both high technical knowledge and natural skill. It was an extremely difficult to find qualified new employees for such a small business. Dealing with the workload that suddenly doubled with the same number of people as before, there was no choice but to increase working hours proportionally. The amount of time mom and dad spent in the house became extremely limited, and the amount of time I spent alone grew, grew dramatically. Even so, I wanted their attention just as badly as before. Sometimes I would sit up waiting, rubbing my drowsy eyes until the machines finally fell quiet. And when I did, my parents would still listen to what I had to say. But even then, they didn't smile like before. Their faces were always lined with exhaustion, their eyes dull. I knew they were busy because Dad's family had been on TV. I just had to tough it out a little longer and things would be back to normal. I did my best to believe that. I waited as patiently as I could for my parents to get less busy. But rather than diminishing, the work kept pouring steadily in. Even after three months, even a half a year, the situation didn't improve in the slightest. In fact, things eventually got so frantic, my parents ha hired a housekeeper to look after things. She cooked and took care of the laundry in Mom's place. She accepted handouts I brought home, and when the and and there were there was a parent sign at school, she was the one who showed up. Oh, that sucks! They were so happy! <laughs> the housekeeper was a diligent person who took her job seriously. She was always nice to me. But that wasn't enough. For some reason, I never felt particularly happy when the housekeeper patted my head gently and praised my achievements. So one day, taking advantage of a brief pause in the feverish activity in my parents' workshop... Oh, fetch! I rushed up to Mom and tried to show off my latest test. <laughs> お母さん、これから取引先の会社さんに行かないといけないの。何時になったら帰ってくるの？うーん、多分とても遅くなるから、また今度ね。Dang。あ、せっかく苦手だった国語のテストで100点を取ったのに。Oh my gosh, it suc
For the first time, I couldn't get her to even glance at the paper. I still remember the shock and anger I felt crumpling the test into a ball. I threw it into the trash can. <sighs> and on the night I turned nine years old, neither mom nor dad were waiting for me. Instead, I was greeted by a feast our housekeeper had prepared and a pile of presents stacked on the table. But I didn't have the slightest interest in the food in front of me, much less the colorfully wrapped boxes. This stuff isn't what I wanted. The only thing on my mind was conveying that simple truth to my parents, and so I sat and I waited. Even when the clock ticked past nine and our housekeeper headed home. Even when unfamiliar shows started to appear on the television, which I'd left on so I could hear the sound of human voices. I didn't budge. God, that isn't the saddest sentence I've ever heard in my life. Shut when show started to appear on the television, which I'd left on so I could hear the sound of human voices. That's so sad. Fetch me. And a little after the hour hand, the clock of, of the clock crept past eleven. The clamor of the machines finally came to a stop. <laughs> Hire people! I know it's hard, but like, fetch me, you need people! そうだな。て、サチ。もしかして私たちの仕事が終わるのを待っていてくれたの? おめでとう、サチ。最近サチには寂しい思いをさせてしまったから、プレゼントも大奮発したのよ。どうしたの、サチ、お腹でも痛くなった？よく見たらご飯も全然食べていないじゃないか。いらない。え、プレゼントもご
You miss the moments that you could have spent with family. You miss the moments where you could have done something that brought you joy, passion. You miss the moments that could pass you by so easily in the pursuit of like the next big thing, the big promotion, the 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 big scoop. I know my dad wrestled with that a lot. He worked as he worked so hard. I mean, he got his master's degree and then he got his PhD while working full time. So he worked full time and came home and then went to classes like at night and start and worked on his thesis. He must have been working on like four hours sleep every day for years. I hardly ever got to see him when I was about Sachi's age here, like eight, nine, ten. I barely, I barely was in his life. <laughs> he was barely in mine. I remember the most I saw him during that time was when I crashed on my bike and broke my wrist. And uh, he, he took some time off just to try and make sure I got to see the right doctors and everything. So I knew he loved me and cared for me. And even now, like, it's funny because we just had Father's Day. And I remember I called him and I was like, you know, as I've gotten older, they always say this happens. But I was like, it really is true. I've really, truly understand and appreciate now all the stuff you sacrificed trying to give me a good life and good experiences. I didn't want to go camping, but he drugged me camping anyway. I didn't always want to go to my grandpa's, but he always took me out there and made sure we spent time with family. I didn't always want to, like, step away from video games or TV to go and la- launch, like, um, water, water bottle rockets in the front yard. But he always made sure to make time for stuff like that. And it's funny because those memories, seeing family, spending time with my dad, doing little science experiments, these things were the things that really defined who I became. And became memories that I cherish to this day. I don't really cherish playing video games growing up. Granted, I'm glad I had it in my life and I have fond memories of playing those games. But it wasn't the games that I find myself reminiscing the most about now. It was that time I spent with him and my mom and my family and the adventures I got drug along on. I still remember to this day, like being such an overweight, out of shape kid, how when I was like 15 or 16, he packed up like a 50 pound backpack for me and a 70 pound backpack for him. And we went hiking into the mountains and camped out by this lake that you couldn't drive to. There was no like, like even rough path. We had to hike to it. And we went and camped and fished and cooked the fish that we caught right there on the lake and, you know, ate that for dinner. And, Spent that time just kind of doing that. And you know what the best thing about that was? The best thing I ever gained from that was the realization I could do it. That really out of shape, nerdy me was able to backpack into a mountain, into a mountain pass, camp out by a lake, help fish up and prepare my own food and get home. Do you know how valuable that is to have when you're younger and how little I knew or cared about it until I was like old enough to realize just how precious that was. So yeah, I know it's a bit of a rant, but I think that's kind of why I wanted to stop here. It's to be like, look, the lesson that this is kind of showing is the lesson that I recently realized on my own of just how important it is to be present in the lives of those around you. Your family, your friends, your kids, your your spouse, your 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 you know partner, your I don't know, your best friends. Those are the moments that are going to end up being the most meaningful in life. And you know, I've gotten to the point now where my grandparents are slowly one by one passing away, and you know, getting that reflective moment there too of being like, I'm really glad I got to spend so much time with them growing up. That my my parents prioritized me seeing my family when I was a kid. So yeah. I think that's a good stuff to be reflecting on here. Powerful stuff, really. And I imagine it's only going to get much, much worse. Because this is Fruit of Grisaia. It's going to get rough. So let's brace ourselves for that next week. Anyway, 
Thank you for listening to my rant. And thank you for supporting me watching this. If you're watching this still, like, wow. Thank you. I appreciate you being here. It makes a lot of a difference for me on the channel. You're, like, how long you watch these videos for, likes and comments and all of that makes the world. And then the people who go out of their way to become members and patrons to support the channel directly, like, I don't deserve any of you. And I... I I am inspired by you every day. I want to keep doing more and being better because of you. So thank you. It means the world to me that you're doing that and you're here and being so supportive and helpful. And I hope that I can, in return, bring something of value to your lives, whatever that may end up being. Because again, we talk about how like cherishing video games. There's a lot to cherish about playing and enjoying and loving a video game. It can be life-changing, which is kind of why I made this channel. But even more so now, I get to make these cherished memories with you. And this is so significant for my life and such a lifeline for me, for my own sanity. I look forward to it every day. And that includes, like, the more miserable parts of it. But I love it. And I'm so grateful I get to share it with you. So thank you. And until next video you're watching me, or, or happen to see me next, I'll see you there.